The world is confronted with its unavoidable destruction, as comrades who have endured countless hardships, the ten most powerful knights tasked with protecting the continent, have now exhausted their life force in mana. Death permeates the tainted lands that stretch far and wide, and it is all caused by a single entity known as the demon commander Gluttony. In the darkness of night, a young boy stands amidst the lifeless bodies of hundreds of people, grieving for the devastating damage inflicted by Gluttony. The immense and monstrous Gluttony looms over him, making the boy seem small and insignificant in comparison. Despite recognizing Gluttony's strength, the boy refuses to surrender his life. He picks up a hammer and unleashes a powerful lightning attack against Gluttony, demonstrating his determination to resist. However, Gluttony mocks the boy's efforts, urging him to give up as they seem futile in the face of such overwhelming power. Striking Gluttony once again with a hammer, the boy named Raven demands that he stops taunting him, with a mighty strike from above, Raven unleashes a technique known as Meteor Objurgation, cleaving the monster in two with his warhammer. In a retort to its taunting, he responds with, Noisy Bastard. From a different angle, the potent technique releases a surge of lightning that obliterates the monster, accompanied by a massive explosion signaling the defeat of Gluttony. He seeks a moment of peace amidst the chaos, however, as he gazes at the monstrous Gluttony, Raven realizes that he might meet his end alongside this formidable foe. He comes to the realization that he has run out of mana. The realization dawns on him that perhaps everything went wrong right from the beginning. Mana training was a closely guarded knowledge reserved for distinguished knights and nobility, which made Raven's path arduous, filled with numerous failures, and progress slower than others. Despite starting from the lowest rank among the knights, he held a firm belief in overcoming any challenge. Yet now he questions if his conviction held true. Reflecting on the past, Raven wonders how different things would have been if he had received proper training methods from the beginning. Such preparation could have enabled him to save the continent and all its inhabitants. As he touches the wound on his belly, he laments the depletion of his mana. Considering Gluttony's power is the seventh among the demon commanders, Raven can't help but ponder the true strength of the other commanders and the dreaded demon king lurking in the shadows. In the middle of nowhere, Raven is sitting alone when suddenly Sword Emperor Odin von Valencia appears in a pitiful state, covered in blood, and asks if Raven is still alive. Odin regrets that he won't survive much longer and, before his end, he wants to ask something curious. He asks Raven why he didn't flee from the battle. Perplexed, Raven inquires what Odin means by that. Odin explains that he had heard Raven was once a child from the slums, seemingly having nothing to protect. He empathizes with the hardships Raven must have faced. Raven shares that he was curious about what Odin was going to ask, but now he feels a bit embarrassed. He confesses that he detests appearing weak, believing that a true man should always exude confidence. He firmly asserts that he wouldn't run away, no matter the circumstances. In response, Odin bursts into laughter. Raven looks at him and comments on his remaining strength, noting that Odin can still find the energy to laugh despite his condition. Odin commends Raven, expressing approval, and tells him that he trusts the talent that has earned Raven a place among the ten strongest knights, a feat he should be proud of. Odin then requests that if Raven ever returns, he should seek him out. Perplexed, Raven questions Odin about his intentions. Odin clarifies that if Raven were to impulsively visit him, the Odin from their past wouldn't believe him. So he promises to share one of his secrets. Odin proceeds to disclose that his daughter's original name was Lily, inspired by a flower he and his wife admired. However, the truth is that Odin didn't particularly like that flower. He urges Raven to remember this crucial piece of information and to find him as soon as possible. Confused and unable to comprehend everything, Raven feels his consciousness slipping away. Suddenly, he awakens in a room that feels oddly familiar, lying on a bed. He ponders whether he has entered another dream. Looking beside him, he spots his sister, her head resting on the bed while he sits on a chair. This surreal scene leaves Raven questioning if he is experiencing yet another dream. Raven finds it unimaginable that he must relive his painful past once more, a past filled with sorrow, where his sister's lifeless body was taken away immediately after her passing. Soon after her demise, unwanted intruders burst in. The thought of Rena, whom Raven holds disdain for hiding the ring, infuriates him. However, in reality, it was Raven who concealed the ring, but his sister ended up bearing the brunt of the attacker's fury as she tried to protect him. Abruptly, the door slams open, and two men enter the room, complaining about how they nearly faced consequences due to her actions. 
Determined to teach her a lesson, one of the men violently kicks the chair on which Raven's sister is sleeping and crudely commands her to wake up. Seeing his sister in such a vulnerable state, Raven recalls how he barely survived with his frail body while she selflessly cared for him despite her injuries. Now, as she falls to the ground after the kick, the other man wonders if she's already dead from a single blow. The man who delivered the kick chuckles wickedly, proud of his Hector Pascal kick. But callously, they continue their torment, seemingly oblivious to the fact that Raven's sister is already deceased. The men's audacity doesn't end there, as they even attempt to take away Raven's sister's lifeless body. One of the men questions the other, pondering why he bothers with a dead body. The other man coldly explains that there are sick individuals who derive pleasure from corpses, not to mention the lucrative market for organs and fresh bodies. Helpless and lying on his bed, Raven desperately shouts for them to stop, questioning whether he is unable to protect anything, even in his dreams. He implores his hand to move, and to his astonishment, it responds. Taking action, Raven attacks the men, and much to his surprise, he manages to knock both of them against the wall. This bold move allows him to save his sister's lifeless body. Infuriated, the men grow angrier and accuse Raven of seeking his death. They brutally beat him, but he refuses to let go of his sister's body. Eventually, the men decide to leave, taunting Raven as a persistent runt who will spend his life with his sister's dead body. As the men depart, Raven notices that the nightmare's conclusion has changed, unlike the relentless loop he had experienced before. Perplexed by the sudden shift, Raven looks at his hands and realizes he can manipulate mana, an ability he didn't possess at this age. Memories of Odin flood back, and he begins to wonder if Odin was the one who sent him to the past. Gradually, Raven comes to a startling realization, this is not a dream but rather a chance to alter the future. The possibility of changing the course of events now lies before him. Overwhelmed with emotions, tears stream down his face as he curses Odin, wishing that he had been sent back a little further in time. Despite coughing up blood and feeling the frailty of his body, Raven recognizes that venting his frustration is futile. He recalls that even the Sword Emperor Odin himself wasn't entirely confident in this power. Nonetheless, Raven echoes Odin's last words, promising to find him as soon as he can. He reassures the Sword Emperor that once he completes what he must do, he will not hesitate to make his way to him. Raven decides to perceive this opportunity as a chance to finally allow his sister to rest in peace, a task he couldn't fulfill in his previous life. Vowing to seek revenge on the person who took his sister's life, a man known as Wolf, Raven reflects on how he barely managed to kill him in his past life by snapping his spine. This time, however, he is determined to exact proper vengeance before anything else. Raven has a destination in mind. With his sister, he carries her to her funeral, gazing at her lifeless form on the deathbed with a heavy heart. Speaking to Rena, Raven expresses his feelings, although they did not share a blood connection, their rare black-colored eyes and hair were the only things that united them. Among the invaders, he faced rejection and harm due to these traits. However, Rena saw him as a symbol of her lost brother. She named him Raven and showered him with genuine love and care. The profound sense of gratitude and indebtedness weighs heavily on Raven, knowing that he can never fully repay his sister's kindness. During the funeral, Zara, Reina's red-haired friend, notices a subtle change in Raven. She attributes it to Reina's passing and recalls a recent visit to his room, where she found him sipping soup by his deceased sister's side. Zara also observes that Raven's wounds have healed. In a solemn and poignant moment, Raven lifts his sister's lifeless body onto his shoulders and walks out of the room. Curious about his intentions, Zara asks where Raven plans to go, considering his injuries. However, Raven insists that he's fine, to which Zara counters that he clearly isn't. She wonders why Raven seems more receptive to Raina's words than hers. Looking up at Zara, Raven expresses gratitude for the soup, assuring her that he will repay her kindness. Afterwards, he proceeds to hold a funeral for his sister Rena, with Zara standing behind him. During the funeral, Zara contemplates Raven's intentions, while Raven resolves that organizing the funeral is his way of making amends to Rena. He chooses not to blame himself or be disheartened, believing it aligns with what Rena would have wanted. Recalling Rena's advice to always be courageous and hold his head high, Raven stands beside her casket and commits to living by her words. Gazing up at the sky, he implores Rena to watch over him from above. With unwavering determination, Raven vows not to have any regrets this time. 
One month later, on a starry night, Raven stands in the middle of a street, determined. He psyches himself up and tells himself, let's go. A passerby notices Raven and recognizes him as the beggar kid from the slums. The person comments that they can collect money from Raven later. Curious about Wolf's whereabouts, Raven asks them directly. This angers the men, and they can't believe Raven dares to mention Wolf's name. One of the men attempts to slap Raven, but to their surprise, Raven catches his arm and questions why he can't do so. Defying the man's expectations, Raven twists his hand, causing the man to scream in pain and kneel on the ground. Baffled by Raven's sudden strength, the other man wonders if he found some sort of potion. However, undeterred, the man decides that despite Raven's unusual strength, he's still just a little brat and tries to grab Raven by his collar to throw him away. Much to their surprise, despite the man's efforts, he can't lift Raven up and questions why he feels so heavy. With a smirk, Raven asks the man if he's wondering what's happening and if he feels heavier than expected. He taunts the man to give up because he won't be able to succeed. Raven swiftly kicks the man away and admires his progress as he has successfully integrated his mana body, a feat he couldn't accomplish in his previous life. Merging a body made of mana with the physical body seamlessly enhances one's power through their mutual interactions. This is the core principle behind the secret technique Raven has developed. Although potent, the technique requires consuming much more food than usual due to its effects. Having devoured Zara's 10 days worth of food, Raven feels grateful for her assistance. The man who was just kicked by Raven desperately crawls away to save himself, but Raven pursues him. With newfound insight, Raven informs the man that he realized something after recreating his mana body. Freshly awakened mana more easily finds its place in damaged bodies. Fearfully, the crawling man inquires what he means. Raven grabs the man by his leg and sends him flying through the air, expressing gratitude for messing with his body. The other men witness the scene and rise to their feet, wondering if an intruder has entered. They glance at Raven, questioning who he is and speculating if he might be the beggar brat. Two leaders positioned above the fray observe the unfolding events, surprised to see the kid arriving alone. They question what he intends to do without a weapon. In response, Raven confidently retorts, grabbing one of the men by his foot and skillfully using him. As a makeshift weapon, swinging the man around. He strikes everyone with his improvised weapon, sending them soaring through the air before landing with resounding thuds. One of them even loses his teeth from the impact. Raven addresses the leader standing above, declaring that he is done with the small fries and that what remains are the formidable Render's brothers. He challenges them to come down and face him. One of the men draws his sword, threatening to cut Raven in two. The other leader informs his comrade that the kid is a mana user, and selling the corpse of a mana user can fetch a high price. Realizing that the person's foot he was using as a weapon is badly broken, Raven discards it. He recalls an incident when an old man noticed him using a human as a weapon and advised him to have some class. The old man taught Raven the importance of learning hand-to-hand -hand combat. In the present, Raven believes that with hand-to-hand -hand combat, he can maintain his dignity. The two leaders launch an aerial attack on Raven, wielding their swords, but Raven remains calm and evades their assaults with agility. He retaliates with a series of punches and kicks, targeting one of the leaders and sending him flying through the air. Seizing the opportunity, Raven swiftly grabs the man by his collar and hurls him forcefully to the ground. With his agility, Raven swiftly follows the man as he falls to the floor, positioning himself in front of him just as he lands and delivering a powerful kick to his side. The moon shines brightly outside, casting its glow on the chaotic hideout as our hero fights, their ruler named Wolf takes notice of Raven and demands to know his identity, watching as his comrades are defeated one by one. To Raven's surprise, he learns that Wolf considers him to be a mere punk from a distant area, unaware of his true heritage as a member of the esteemed Beastman tribe, known for their superiority among the demi-human races. In his previous life, Raven faced the daunting task of defeating Wolf, a remarkable silver werewolf with royal lineage. This revelation leaves Raven wondering why such a powerful being is present in this place and time. Nevertheless, Raven is determined to uncover the truth. When Wolf questions if Raven is responsible for the current situation, Raven sarcastically asks if Wolf cannot already tell. This provokes Wolf, who threatens to harm Raven by ripping his mouth off. Undeterred, Raven welcomes the challenge and encourages Wolf to give it his all. In response, Wolf undergoes a transformation, turning into a golden wolf. 
This astonishes Raven, who taunts Wolf by questioning the nature of his transformation. Raven ponders why Wolf's fur isn't silver as it was in his past life. Raven asks what kind of puppy have he become, the words infuriating Wolf. Wolf's red eyes become filled with rage upon hearing the word, puppy. In response, Wolf charges towards Raven, initiating a battle between them. With agility, Raven skillfully avoids Wolf's attack, swiftly evading the strike. Despite the sudden increase in Wolf's speed and strength, surpassing even the Render's brothers, Raven realizes that Wolf is not the same as he was in his previous life. Reacting swiftly, Raven seizes Wolf's mouth, silencing him, and questions if this is all Wolf has to offer. Tossing Wolf aside, Raven smirks, recalling advice he received from a fellow beastman about dealing with berserk kinfolk. As Wolf rises uncontrollably and attacks without hesitation, Raven remarks that beating a crazed dog is the best approach. He kicks Wolf repeatedly, causing him to cough up blood. Despite the beating, Raven urges Wolf not to submit yet, as he needs to keep hitting him until Lisa arrives. Following the advice of the Beastman, Raven continues to kick Wolf, causing him to scream in pain. The Beastman had assured Raven that it is acceptable to inflict some harm since Beastmen possess excellent regenerative abilities. Finally, Raven delivers a powerful kick that sends Wolf crashing into a wall, causing him to revert back to his human form. Raven questions if Wolf has come to his senses, but Wolf implores him, asking why he is treating him this way and what he wants from him. Disregarding Wolf's inquiries, Raven sternly declares that this time it won't end with just his spine. He demands that Wolf beg his sister, Rena, for forgiveness for the harm he inflicted upon her. Determined to bring solace to his sister's spirit, Raven clasps his hands in a prayer gesture, closes his eyes, and hopes that this act provides some comfort to her. Returning his attention to the miserable figure of Wolf lying on the floor, Raven asserts that if it were up to him, he would have taken Wolf's head. In response, Wolf swiftly kneels and acknowledges his wrongdoings, apologizing to Lady Rena for his actions. Raven commands Wolf to cut off a part of himself and bring it as an offering to his sister's grave. However, he has a change of heart, realizing that his sister probably wouldn't want to see Wolf's face even in the afterlife. Instead, Raven instructs Wolf to answer his questions while he beats him. The first question he poses is about Wolf's presence in this place. While confronting Wolf, Raven's attention is drawn to a nearby stone. Curious, he picks it up and realizes that he has never seen this stone in his previous life. To his astonishment, he identifies it as a demonic key, a wolf with silver fur, emerges from within the stone, attempting to break free from the oppressive black and red aura that surrounds him. In Raven's past life, he recalls strolling through a forest with a girl who wanted to introduce him to the spiritual creatures residing there. The girl explains that spiritual creatures are sentient beings reborn after accumulating mana for at least 10 years. Raven expresses surprise at the existence of spiritual creatures beyond Elbenheim and the rarity of animal spirits. The girl then asks if Raven is aware that the soul of a spiritual creature is a spirit, though not a spirit tamer himself, Raven confidently affirms his knowledge. Holding a stone in her hands, the girl asks Raven if he knows about the quintessence of a spirit in the present day. Raven discovers a similar stone near Wolf and holds it in his hands, recognizing it as a spirit stone, while Wolf continues to apologize. Raven's attention is drawn to the valuable stone he discovered, and he finds it intriguing that a werewolf possesses such a precious item. As he examines the stone further, Raven realizes that it is emitting demonic kai, commonly associated with spirit stones of demons. Peculiar chains materialize before him, and he is determined to address these strange chains. He delivers powerful punches, breaking them and releasing a trapped silver wolf. Perplexed, Raven wonders if this is a memory of a spirit and questions why the wolf is surrounded by individuals emanating demonic kai. These individuals attack the silver wolf, causing it to bleed and collapse on the ground. One of them takes the wolf's spirit stone and hands it to a child among their group. Trying to comprehend the situation, Raven questions the identity of the child and the reason for handing him the spirit stone. He realizes that these malevolent individuals are creating beastmen by forcing people to absorb spirit stones, transforming them into wolf-like beings. Raven observes Wolf, who continues to apologize, and deduces that they were created through the absorption of spirit stones, but this time the process was incomplete. As the silver wolf continues to attack the other wolf, now transformed back into a human, Raven intervenes by jumping in between them. 
He urges the Silver Wolf to stop, believing that the other guy deserves a less wretched fate. To his surprise, Raven realizes that the Silver Wolf can understand him, even though he doesn't consider himself talented in spirit taming. This recollection prompts him to remember his conversation with a girl named Astina in the jungle, where she mentioned that a human could become a spirit tamer if they possess a pure soul and sufficient mana. Raven contemplated that only young children possess the purity needed for such an endeavor. However, upon realizing his own youth, he doubted whether he possessed the necessary purity. Observing this, the silver wolf shook its head, leaving Raven curious about its intentions. The silver wolf gently pats Raven on the head with his mouth, leading Raven to realize that when he broke the chain, his mana flowed into the wolf's spirit stone, allowing them to communicate. Raven decides to form a contract with the Silver Wolf and extends his hand towards him. Raven considers providing the Silver Wolf with just enough mana to ensure its survival, thereby making it a valuable ally. He reflects on the fact that most spirits grow stronger as the Spirit Tamer's strength increases, which was one of the reasons why Estina was considered one of the best among the Ten Knights. Noticing the growl of the Silver Wolf, Raven understands that it is requesting a favor. As their eyes meet, Raven realizes that the wolf wants him to seek vengeance on its behalf. With mana flowing into his hands, Raven assures the wolf that it is not a big deal, as he had already planned to eliminate all individuals associated with demonic key. Raven reaches out and touches the silver wolf, knowing that the final step in forming a contract with a spirit is to decide the name. He ponders how he should name the wolf and Raven affectionately pats his head while holding his paw, observing his silver fur resembling the moon. They settle on the name Lunar Wolf. Raven gazes at the apologetic wolf and wonders about the mastermind behind the creation of beastmen with spirit stones. He suspects it might be the work of demon worshippers, fanatics who reject avatars and instead worship the demon king. These malevolent worshippers had already caused chaos in the world even before the demon king's army appeared. Although Raven was in the labyrinth at that time and lacked the full details, he feels frustrated. He kicks the apologetic wolf out of frustration and demands that he be quiet. Raven then asks about the child who gave him the spirit stone, questioning whether he is one of the demon worshippers. As the wolf remains in a subconscious state, repeatedly apologizing, Raven realizes that he is still not fully aware of his surroundings. He beseeches the lunar wolf to wake him up with a mighty roar, and the wolf manages to snap him back to his senses. Raven persists in asking about the child and wonders where to find him. The wolf responds with a single word, organization. Intrigued, Raven probes further and asks what they are doing. In response, the wolf pounds the floor and laughs, warning that the organization won't let Raven escape their grasp. He reveals that he was merely a test subject and, before he can divulge more about their great power, an unexpected explosion decimates his head. Raven is intrigued, wondering if they placed an enchantment on the wolf's mouth to prevent him from revealing crucial information. As he ponders this, a memory from his past life resurfaces, where a man had warned him about their organization relentlessly pursuing him. Initially, Raven assumed that the man was talking about his subordinates on the first floor. However, when Raven defeated those individuals, they were unaware that Wolf was a beast man. Deciding to set it aside, Raven acknowledged that he hasn't always used his head. Amidst the chaos, Raven noticed a crack in the wall emitting a mysterious blue glow. Recognizing its importance, Raven firmly grabbed Wolf by the arm and questioned whether he should start reclaiming what was once taken from him. With a forceful throw, Wolf collided with the wall, and Raven, contemplating how he would handle the situation if he were the sword's emperor, saw his wolf once more. Recalling a story shared by Emperor Odin, Raven contemplated sharing it with Odin someday. Placing Wolf's hand on the illuminated object in the wall, a door opened, and Raven entered, referring to Wolf as his old ally but swiftly amending it to a future ally. This led to a treasure room where Raven picked up a ring, asserting that he needed to take the Valencia family's ring. When Raven was in a pitiful state as a very young child on the street, a girl approached him, inquired about his name, and remarked that it was cute. The girl then took off one of her rings and gifted it to him, advising him to seek her out with the ring when he needed help. As Raven looked at the ring, he recalled that everyone in the Aslan Empire knew her as Clo von Valencia, Chloe, the youngest daughter of the Sword Emperor Odin von Valencia. In Raven's previous life, he couldn't retrieve the ring as his quest for revenge took time and finding assistance was challenging. However, this time, the ring could be of great help. While stashing the ring in his pocket, 
Raven wondered where the Sword Emperor could be, smirking as he felt the time was right. Leaving the scene behind, Raven overheard a group of people discussing the dead bodies strewn on the ground, realizing that he is undoubtedly a mana user. The commander among them questioned if a single child caused all this mayhem. The commander scolded them for using a drug he had warned them about. Commander Axel, in charge at Files Outer Castle, wondered how Wolf was handling his men. Seizing the opportunity to raise his protection fee, Commander Axel decided to use the situation as an excuse. Spotting Raven standing there, he recognized him, and people around the commander began talking about him. The commander questioned whether Raven was responsible for all the chaos, and Raven confirmed it, descending the stairs. The commander then questioned whether Raven comprehended the magnitude of his actions. Raven expressed that he was dealing with corrupt individuals and questioned why a knight like the commander needed to intervene. In Raven's view, it seemed like Commander Axel had been accepting excessive bribes from Wolf. Enraged, Commander Axel retorted that Raven had a lot of nerve and tried to attack him. Raven observed that Axel had only reached the second level of mana usage, slapping away Axel's approaching hand. With a swift move, Raven kicked Commander Axel, aiming to send him flying back through the stairs. Holding back from drastic actions, for now, Raven understood the vast number of night troops under Commander Axel's command. Commander Axel complimented Raven on his abilities, but without warning, Axel threw a punch, sending Raven flying backward. Realizing that he shouldn't make the estate head his enemy just yet, Raven understood the vast number of night troops under Commander Axel's command. For the time being, Raven opted to make Commander Axel leave on his own. Descending the stairs, Axel noticed him and questioned why Raven didn't attempt to take the blow. Launching another attack, Lunar Wolf suddenly appeared behind Raven, startling Axel, who wondered if it was a spirit. With the situation seemingly calmer, Raven decided to engage in a conversation with Commander Axel. He asked Axel to be honest and acknowledged that this issue didn't concern Axel as long as he received the money. Commander Axel inquires about Raven's point, and when asked such a question, Raven proposes to Commander Axel that instead of receiving payment from Wolf, he could be paid with money. Commander Axel is taken aback by the suggestion, surprised that such an idea could come from a kid. He then asks Raven about his age and wonders if he used magic to transform himself. Raven clarifies that he is a native of this land and points out that he is well known for his black hair, unlike an invader. Commander Axel accepts his explanation and asks if Raven can pay him five white gold coins, the amount that Wolf used to pay. Raven finds the amount ridiculous and jokingly asks how far Axel plans to go with his demands. He suggests offering one and a half coins instead, stating that Wolf used to pay him one coin, further infuriating Commander Axel. However, Raven remains firm and tells him they can conclude their business there and then if he doesn't agree. Amused by the situation, Commander Axel comments on the world coming to an end with a kid negotiating like that. Eventually, he relents and decides to leave. Before leaving, he reminds Raven that the last day of the month is the due date for the payment, and he expects Raven to keep his promise. Onlookers inquire if Commander Axel is really going to leave like that. In response, Commander Axel slaps one of them, telling him to be quiet. Meanwhile, Raven calls out to Axel from behind and tosses a coin toward him, which he catches. Raven explains that since the ownership of the place has changed, the new owner should at least greet the estate head. He asks if Axel can arrange a meeting with the estate head. Axel agrees to report the matter to the estate head but warns Raven to pay on time or face the consequences of the estate head's wrath. Smirking confidently, Raven assures him that if there will be any next due date, he'll make sure to handle it. As the people start leaving, Raven stops them and gives them an hour's notice. He instructs them to gather everyone, including the gay members, women working in the invader, and the begging kids, warning them of the consequences of being late or attempting to escape. Raven threatens that he will take a life every minute for tardiness, and if they try to run away, his spirit will track them down and end them. Raven reminds them not to forget they have only one hour. The group quickly scurries to follow his instructions. Holding the ring in his hand, Raven contemplates how this plan could lead to taking control of this place in just a week. He expresses his anticipation to Duke Valencia upon their return. The people are out of breath, and Zara rushes to hold Raven's hand, concerned about his injury. Raven reassures her that it's not his blood and reveals that Wolf is already dead. Zara looks at Wolf's lifeless body in disbelief, observing the fear in the people's eyes. 
Raven realizes that they are afraid that the estate head won't spare anyone who challenges his nobility. Everyone in the invader knows that the estate head is backing Wolf, and the people worry about the consequences if they are punished for attempting to challenge the nobility. Holding a book, Raven scoffs at their concerns and questions the consequences for the estate head of Files, who is making a mockery out of Valencia. Outside the castle, two guards are engaged in a conversation. One of them remarks that he hasn't seen Sir Ram around lately and wonders if he might be on vacation. The other guard questions if he hasn't heard the news about Ram being under probation due to an incident in the invader. The first guard appears surprised and asks if Ram did something wrong. The second guard reminds him about the fight that erupted among the local thugs and how they all claimed to see a giant monster wolf coming after them. The first guard recalls the incident where everyone seemed to hallucinate simultaneously. The second guard agrees and adds that their leader, Wolf, was in a terrible state and lost all his money mysteriously. The first guard connects the dots and explains that during Ram's negotiations with the new boss, a problem arose. Every shop and store in the town are closed, and the visiting merchants express their grievances as they haven't been making any profits lately. The other guard remarks that it's understandable for the estate head to be angry, which may explain why the new boss has been summoned. Meanwhile, Raven listens in on their conversation, and the guard asks the other guard about the name of the person they were talking about earlier. Raven recalls when he held a book and asked about the fate of the estate head of Files, who was ridiculing Duke Valencia. Zara questions what he's referring to, explains that in his past life, he used to believe that all nobilities were the same. Even after inspecting the account book, he failed to notice anything amiss. Following the estate head's request, Raven handed over half of Wolf's fortune and the account book. However, in return, he only managed to gain a few acquaintances from Invader. Nevertheless, things are different for Raven now. Despite not being the brightest individual, his experience as a knight has taught him that there are nobilities who stand far above the rest. While holding the book, Raven catches Zara's attention, and she asks him if this will lead to the downfall of the estate head. Raven advises her not to worry about understanding it at the moment since it's not crucial. Perplexed, Zara asks him to clarify, and Raven reassures her that the most important thing is that nobody in Invader needs to fear Wolf anymore. They are all free from his tyranny. Zara is taken aback and asks if they are truly free now. Raven confirms it and encourages them to seize this last opportunity for revenge or to release their pent-up anger. Enraged, Zara marches towards Wolf and strikes him, cursing him for destroying her prosperous family. She swears not to let him die peacefully. Others present also join in the march, vowing to avenge their friends who were brutally beaten by Wolf. Sitting back and observing, Raven realizes he lacks the skill for comforting others, and it doesn't align with his method of repaying debts or healing wounds. However, he advises the people to take back as much as they desire from this situation. Money can be a great aid in this process. Raven informs them that the treasure belonging to Wolf is available for anyone, especially women and children who were compelled to stay in Invader. He encourages them to take the money and leave. One of the women among them asks if he is giving them all this money and wonders if he is serious. Zara raises a question about what Raven intends to do. He reassures her that he is fine as he already obtained the money he needed. Zara insists that everyone in the world needs money, but Raven explains that it's important to understand the source of this money. Even if they send the wicked guy to hell, the money will remain on earth. As they look at Wolf's treasure, the people express astonishment at the vast amount of money they see. One woman wonders if she could have all of it. Addressing the crowd, Raven offers a piece of advice and warns them against committing wrongdoings for money or leaking any information to the estate head. He cautions that his friend Lunar Wolf will track them down and tear them apart piece by piece if they betray their trust. Raven suggests to Zara that if she's leaving the estate of Files, he recommends going with Luna. He advises her to always travel in a group and hire mercenaries from a reputable guild. Confused, Zara asks if he means they are leaving on their own without him. Raven explains that he has other matters to attend to. Understanding his decision, Zara expresses confidence in his strength and assures him that they will follow his advice and head to Luna. She tells him that if things become too difficult for him, he can always find her. In gratitude, Raven thanks Zara for everything. As a result of their actions, the red light district of Files Invader is now closed. Meanwhile, the guards who were previously discussing the new boss begin to wonder about the new boss's name. Suddenly, 
Raven emerges before them and confidently states, Raven. The guard notices his presence and asks how long he has been there. They assert that, as a commoner, he shouldn't be lingering in the area where the head and the legions reside. The guard is perplexed and wonders how this child knows the name of the new boss. Raven confidently explains that he is the new boss. Suddenly, Lunar Wolf appears, frightening the guards, who promptly flee in fear. Raven sighs, frustrated by the fact that people always react strangely to his childlike appearance wherever he goes. Inside the castle, Raven stands before Ron, the Grand Master of Files Knight Order. Ron acknowledges having heard about Raven from Ram but comments on his young age. Displeased with being kept standing, Raven remarks on the lack of courtesy in letting a guest stand while they are being observed. This angers Ron, who asserts that Raven needs to understand his place. In response, Raven stands his ground and reminds Ron that the same goes for him. Unfazed by the fact that the Grand Master draws his sword at him, Raven questions Ron's sanity, given that Raven is the guest of the estate head. Ron taunts Raven, remarking that it's no surprise his tongue stinks given his background of living in the trash. Unfazed, Raven retorts that he can't be certain about his tongue, but the stink seems to be emanating from Ron himself, who has the most rotten mouth among the Knight's Order. This response infuriates Ron, and he instinctively reaches for his sword, only to be stopped by the old man who intervenes and informs him that the head has been waiting for Raven. Reluctantly, Ron puts his sword away and cautions Raven to be careful inside, as the head is known to be strict. Brushing off the warning, Raven dismissively responds, yeah, yeah, of course. Secretly scheming to eliminate Raven as soon as he gets permission, Ron leads the way to the door of the head's office, announcing the arrival of Raven, the one from the back alleys. The head instructs them to enter, and as Raven lays eyes on the head, he wonders if that figure is the estate head. Raven greets the ruler of Files by bowing down, and the head asks where he learned his good manners. Raven explains that he practiced a bit to be polite in front of him. The head, who is also Baron praises of Files, Baron praises Raven's ability to act like a knight. While this is happening, Raven thinks that he's having trouble getting used to this situation. He wonders if Baron is the same overweight estate head he knew in his previous life. As Raven reflects, he remembers that Baron had a drug problem back then. He wonders if Baron looked like this before he started using drugs. Despite the change in appearance, Raven knows Baron was a noble in his past life and still is now. Anyways, Raven realizes that an account book going to the Duke of Valencia could harm Baron's position. This gives Raven the opportunity for proper revenge. Baron talks to Raven and mentions that he didn't treat Sir Ron the same way. Raven responds by asking how he can treat the boss and a worker in the same manner. Raven says he wants to work for Baron as well. This makes Ron angry. Baron then asks Raven if he sees the leader of their group as someone to compete with. Baron shows surprise at Raven's big dreams, but then Baron questions Raven's age. He wonders if Raven might have a mix of dwarf or elf ancestry. Raven lets Baron know that he's only 13 this year, which surprises Ron. Baron says it doesn't matter since they can see Raven right in front of them. But Baron points out that even though Raven wants to work for him, he has taken Baron's money without permission. Baron asks Raven to explain why he did that. Raven tells him it was for Baron's own good. When Baron hears that, he comments that he initially thought Raven was clever, but now it seems he doesn't quite grasp how things work in the world. Ron asks Baron if he wants him to immediately remove Raven from the situation. At this point, Raven steps in and asks Baron if he's aware that the Duke of Valencia has launched a crackdown on drugs and prostitution. Raven adds that he's certain Baron knows that Lady Valencia paid a visit to his territory. He reveals that he learned this information from her associates, and his aim was to tidy things up for Baron before any problems arose. Raven smirks, feeling pretty sure that he's sharing the truth and doesn't think Baron will run into any trouble if he decides to dig deeper into the matter. Baron thinks back to an occasion related to their youngest daughter's special ceremony, recalling that they were planning something significant at that time. Ron tries to brush off these thoughts as being just ideas from a child, emphasizing that Valentino is known for its not-so-good places. But before Ron can go on, Baron interrupts him and tells him to be careful about what he's saying and asks him not to go too far or cross certain limits. Quickly recognizing his mistake, Ron promptly apologizes. Baron responds to Raven, acknowledging his point and agreeing that if Raven's words hold true, even if the approach is rough, it's something commendable. 
Raven expresses his gratitude for Baron's understanding. Additionally, Baron raises another matter he wants to clarify. He observes that it seems Raven has command over a wolf spirit, wondering if Raven obtained this spirit by taking it from wolf spirit stone. This revelation surprises Raven, leaving him curious as to how Baron could have known about this. As Lunar Wolf makes an appearance, Raven notices a circle formed from demonic energy near Baron. This leads Raven to contemplate whether Baron is a dark magician. He reflects on the idea that devils typically demand sacrifices in return for lending their power. With the presence of a second circle magician, Baron appears to be someone who is engaged in disturbing and dark practices, perhaps even involving the sacrifice of numerous lives. These thoughts trigger a memory for Raven, hearkening back to a scene where two men stood over his sister's lifeless body. One of the men questioned the other about why he bothered with her body, given that she was already dead. The other disturbingly replied that there are individuals with twisted inclinations who find pleasure in corpses, not to mention that organs and bodies can fetch a considerable sum of money. Raven's memory takes him to another incident where he confronted two leaders in a fight. In that encounter, one of them looked at Raven and casually remarked that due to Raven having the body of a mana user, it could be sold for a high price. This realization dawns on Raven, connecting the dots and leading him to the conclusion that Baron was the one who had been purchasing corpses from Invader. Another piece falls into place in Raven's understanding. Wolf had the support of a dark magician. Baron directs a question at Raven, asking why he's not responding. In response, Raven admits that he doesn't grasp the essence of Baron's inquiry. This visibly agitates Baron, who then instructs Ron. Responding swiftly, Ron unsheathes his sword. Recognizing that facing both of them simultaneously might be a challenge, Raven summons Lunar Wolf in response. Lunar Wolf's appearance startles Ron enough for him to step back, while Baron sits calmly on his sofa. Baron remarks that Raven truly holds authority over the forest. Contemplating the current situation, Baron acknowledges that they have no choice but to consider acquiring a new test subject. This leads Raven to wonder about the subject in question, pondering if Baron plans to use him as a replacement for Wolf in their experiments. Baron inquires with Ron about Raven's level of power, and Ron provides the information that Raven is on the brink of reaching level 2. Seeking clarification, Baron asks if this implies that Raven is already comparable to a knight. Ron clarifies that unless Raven comes from a well-known family that imparted mana manipulation training from a young age, it's quite remarkable for him to have attained such proficiency. Ron adds that it's unlikely Raven acquired this skill entirely on his own, highlighting the precision and stability of Raven's mana control. In response, Raven elaborates that he inherited this knowledge from his family's closely guarded tradition. Baron proceeds to question Raven once more, prompting him to provide an accurate response this time. Raven deliberates on whether he should reveal the true source of his training. He realizes that they might not believe him if he claims to have developed it independently. Consequently, he informs them that he learned it from his late parents, who passed down the knowledge before he arrived in files. Raven expands upon his explanation, describing the breathing technique as something he has been practicing since infancy. He notes that due to his recent increase in strength, he has come to realize that it's a unique and distinct method. This realization prompts a smirk from Raven as he muses about Baron's chances of verifying the truth, given that Baron has accepted refugees from various places to bolster income from Invader. Raven believes it will be impossible for Baron to trace his background or records. Raven then presents his presence before Baron as evidence of his authenticity. Baron concurs, agreeing that Raven's presence does indeed serve as proof. This outcome surprises Raven, finding it easier than he had expected. Baron discloses his intention to verify Raven's details through someone referred to as, he. This mention of, he, leaves Raven curious about who exactly Baron is referring to. Baron instructs Raven to wait for a while. He explains that since Raven's actions led to Wolf's demise and subsequent turmoil, he needs a scapegoat to assign blame. This concept of blame puzzles Raven, prompting him to speculate on who might be implicated. He wonders whether he is linked to the organization Wolf had mentioned earlier. Raven also contemplates the possibility of, he, being a powerful dark magician, a prospect that he finds concerning. Baron urges Raven to respond, reminding him that Raven had previously expressed a desire to serve Baron. He implies that the offer at hand may not be unfavorable to Raven given his earlier aspirations. Raven offers a bow, expressing his willingness to comply if Baron issues such an order. 
With a respectful tone, he then inquires whether he is an esteemed guest. Baron confirms this, advising Raven to exercise more caution and politeness in the presence of he. In this moment, Raven recognizes that he still holds a card to play. He calculates the timeline required for the Duke's men to verify the authenticity of the account book, about three days, the assembly of a punitive army, another three days, and the army's journey to files, approximately ten days. Adding it all up, this totals a little over fifteen days. With this time frame in mind, Raven proceeds to inquire about the arrival of Baron's guest. Baron responds to Raven's question with curiosity, wondering why Raven is seeking this information. Raven explains that understanding the timing is crucial for him to appropriately prepare and exhibit proper manners. Amused by Raven's approach, Baron chuckles and asks if that's the reason. He then reveals that, he, is expected to arrive in a week, advising Raven not to disappoint him. This revelation leaves Raven feeling disheartened, as it seems his strategy may not align perfectly with the anticipated timeline. In his chamber within the head's castle, Raven engages in a warm-up routine all the while reflecting on the question, did he mention a week? This pondering brings to light two distinct choices. The first option involves fleeing. Raven considers that the residents of Invader should have had ample time to depart by now, which means that escaping alongside them might not be too difficult if he decides to take this path. Outwitting the head's men could potentially be managed without much trouble. However, Raven recognizes the potential complications that could arise from this choice. Being placed on the head's wanted list would prove problematic, especially when it comes to his planned meeting with the Sword Emperor. Since Raven has certain expectations from the Sword Emperor, he understands the importance of avoiding any actions that might jeopardize those future plans. Furthermore, the mere idea of running away doesn't sit well with Raven. Despite his lack of strength, he has always approached challenges with the mindset of finding a way to conquer his adversaries. Considering the second option, Raven questions the legitimacy of the guest's impending arrival within a week. He ponders whether this visit is truly an official one, particularly given how the estate head had addressed the guest with an air of high nobility. Moreover, the conspicuous absence of people within the estate head's residence just before the guest's arrival raises suspicion in Raven's mind. Raven's deduction leads him to believe that this could be an underhanded, unofficial visit. He deduces that the supporter behind the estate head is likely someone who cannot openly reveal their identity. With this in mind, he contemplates the potential outcomes of an unforeseen major event in files before the guest's scheduled arrival. Such an occurrence could shift the focus and attention toward the estate head's home, possibly resulting in the postponement or cancellation of the visit. Although this approach involves a considerable level of risk, it aligns with Raven's customary approach to challenges. However, he acknowledges that for this strategy to succeed, he needs to significantly bolster his own strength. This is crucial to effectively overcome both the Grand Master and the Estate Head. Sensing mealtime approaching, Raven concludes his warm-up session and departs from his room to the cafeteria. In the cafeteria, a cook attempting to serve food inadvertently spills it outside someone's bowl, prompting the recipient to admonish the cook for his inattentiveness. Following the cook's gaze, the recipient looks towards Raven with curiosity and astonishment rippling through the cafeteria's occupants. All of them are taken aback by the sheer amount of food Raven appears capable of ingesting. Some even wonder if Raven possesses dwarf lineage, given the notion that dwarves share an appetite similar to orcs. Raven's mana-infused body, which has overcome its earlier problems, gets a little stronger every time he eats. His power increases as he eats more. This special ability means he doesn't need to use medicines or herbal treatments. From behind, someone approaches Raven and addresses him. The man poses a question, inquiring if Raven is the same homeless boy who learned his manners from a dog. In response, Raven offers a succinct response, a simple, yeah. This prompts the man to chastise Raven, urging him to exhibit respect when interacting with adults. With a fleshless bone clutched in his hand, Raven sneers in disbelief mocking the idea of receiving respect, especially from someone who is picking a fight with a child. The man demands to know what Raven said, and in response, Raven playfully tickles the man with the bone, all while pointing out the ambiguity of his intentions. He questions why the man can't make up his mind. This exchange ignites a surge of fury within the man, prompting him to forcefully strike the table nearby. A man named Gren intervenes, urging the man to calm down as Raven is just a youngster. Meanwhile, Ron approaches Gren from behind, instructing him to stay composed. 
Remaining composed in his seat, Raven suggests to the man that if he's curious about Raven's strength, he should go ahead and inquire. The man warns Raven not to be all talk and no action. Internally, Raven braces himself for the forthcoming confrontation with the Grand Master. He quickly corrects his thought, realizing that it's not just the Grand Master but also the estate head who is the driving force behind the situation on the battlefield, and that man Finn stands face to face. Finn issues a challenge, inviting Raven to come at him while warning that he will personally teach Raven a lesson. In response, Raven raises a question, asking Finn if he's truly certain he won't regret this choice. Amused by the term, regret, Finn chuckles and urges Raven to arm himself with a sword, emphasizing his intention to swiftly settle matters. Tauntingly, Finn questions whether Raven is feeling fearful, displaying a hint of overconfidence, Raven replied, well, if you say so. Without warning, Raven swiftly kicks Finn's legs, causing him to stumble backward from the force. Finn is taken aback, almost losing his balance. He grits his teeth in pain and clenches his fists, preparing to retaliate with a punch. However, Raven skillfully evades the attack. Raven channels mana into his legs and launches another powerful kick, striking Finn's other leg. Once again, Finn experiences the searing pain, causing him to question if this is the strength of a mere level 1. Determined not to be defeated, Finn infuses his legs with red mana, realizing that he cannot afford to lose in this manner. Raven remarks that Finn is quite resilient. In a fit of rage, Finn raises both hands, attempting to deliver an overhead hammer punch. However, Raven swiftly maneuvers between Finn's legs, disrupting his momentum. Raven then turns to face Finn. Finn is taken aback by the sudden turn of events. As he looks back, he sees Raven airborne, wrapping his legs around the back of Finn's neck. Raven firmly grasps Finn's head and chin, reassuring him that he has no intention of killing him. Suddenly, a loud scream echoes throughout the area, and in the next moment, Finn lies on the ground unconscious. Raven casually claps his hands, as if to brush off the fight as if it were nothing. The spectators were in disbelief as Sir Finn was defeated by a young boy. Following the fight, Raven notices Ron looking at him, and their eyes meet. Ron then turns around and walks away. Raven contemplates how he intentionally defeated a knight in front of a crowd, without relying on the assistance of the Lunar Wolf. He acknowledges that not many people possess such capability. As the defeated Finn is escorted away by others, Raven contemplates how his actions will likely give pause to the feudal head's intentions to remove him. As he wraps his hands, Raven considers that this accomplishment has increased his chances of success. However, suddenly, he feels a strange sensation, as if his body is weakening, and he nearly collapses to the ground. Right now, Raven is thinking of whether he went too far with his actions. He had to beat Finn because he wanted to become better than him, even though it wasn't an easy choice. This happened because Raven had to use up his magical energy unexpectedly. If this had happened in his old life, he would have had to try really hard. In Raven's past life, his magical body wasn't as good, his physical injuries healed quickly, but his mana took a long time to come back. But now, in his new life, his mana body is fully integrated, which means he doesn't have this problem anymore. He can do tough training without much trouble, and he's getting much stronger than he was before. Baron is sitting at a table to eat, and his servants are bringing him food. Raven is nearby too. Baron realizes that what he thinks about Raven is wrong because recent events have shown that Raven is reliable. Raven expresses gratitude to him for believing in him and personally checking on the situation. He receives a plate with a piece of steak on it. Baron lets Raven know that the steak is made from veal. Baron also mentions that they have prepared various other dishes, and Raven is encouraged to enjoy as much as he wants. In a polite manner, Raven responds that he feels they might have prepared too much food for breakfast. This surprises Baron, who had thought that the powerful attack Raven used to defeat the knight was fueled by Raven's hearty appetite. Raven explains that the events from yesterday unfolded because the knight had lowered his guard. In response, Baron tells Raven that he is being too humble and expresses his strong anticipation for Raven's promising future. Baron adds a touch of regret, mentioning that it's unfortunate there isn't a mentor available to guide a talented individual like Raven. Raven acknowledges that many knights in history grew up without a teacher, yet the ones who truly excelled often had a great master to guide them. Baron asks Raven if he learned about history. 
As Raven sits at the table with his meal, using a knife and fork, Baron notices that Raven has also learned how to behave properly while eating, just like Baron suspected. It's becoming clear that Raven is not an ordinary person. In his mind, Raven realizes that he acquired these skills from his previous life. Baron continues to talk, saying that if his guess is right, he understands Raven's thoughts. He suggests that there might be a way to figure out more about Raven's background by considering that place. This makes Raven curious about what that place could be. Baron then says that he will explain all the details. Baron adds that they got in touch with him yesterday, and he was really happy about it. In Raven's thoughts, he finds Baron's behavior puzzling, and he suspects that Baron might be addicted to something. It looks like Baron is okay because of the magic circle's power, but they don't know when the demon might want it back. In Raven's previous life, it seems Baron was left behind by someone important during the war, and that's when he lost his magic. While sipping his tea, Baron tells Raven that he should be excited about meeting this important person. Baron lets Raven know that this person, whom he refers to as him, is significant and will give Raven an important job. Raven says thank you to Baron for this chance. Raven's determination grows as he engages in rigorous training with a dummy. Despite his concerns about him, and the organization mentioned by the Baron, he decides that there is no immediate need to delve into that matter. Instead, he focuses on the present and ensures that he is well prepared for whatever lies ahead. The estate head is a second level magician, and Ron is a powerful second level fighter. Ron might be a bit stronger, but they're about the same in terms of skill. This is because magicians and fighters who use mana are at similar levels. In his past life, Raven had already surpassed this stage, so he's determined to move up quickly. He thinks he can do it in six days. After three days, Raven is still practicing, and he realizes his body might be small, but he's definitely become much stronger. His flexibility has increased, and his weight and strength are concentrated in a better way. Raven's movements are much better now compared to his previous life. He understands now that his overly big and powerful appearance was a problem in his old life. He just wanted to be large and strong, and his unconscious mana body reacted to that desire. This made his body overly big and disrupted the balance between his mana and physical body. He realizes that being big doesn't always mean being strong. Two men approached the training area and saw the little kid who had destroyed Sir Finn's ankle. They get scared and decide to leave, saying they'll come back another time. Raven politely asks them to stay away from him. Over the past three days, everyone has lost interest since Raven has been eating and training non-stop. Ron comes over to the training area and notices Raven. He tells Raven to come with him because the estate head wants Raven to get armed. Raven notices Ron sore and thinks it's perfect timing. Ron mentions how highly the estate head thinks of Raven, so he asks Raven to appreciate it. They go into a locked place, and Raven looks around. He sees armors that seem expensive, but none of them fit him. Then, Raven notices weapons, but there's nothing like a mace or a warhammer. Feeling a tinge of disappointment, he believes that this method won't allow him to earn extra money. Raven then asks Ron if he could obtain a sword similar to Kranz's. Ron, filled with pride, promptly responds and questions whether Raven believes his sword resembles an ordinary iron blade. He proceeds to speak about his sword, known as Grius, crafted by the renowned swordmaster Rogers. In response, Ron cautions Raven against coveting something beyond his current capabilities. Raven wonders if Ron comprehends the immense effort invested in creating that particular sword and suggests that it might suit him even better. In a playful manner, Raven remarks that good weapons should be wielded by skilled individuals, emphasizing that it is for the benefit of the estate leader. Ron becomes increasingly angry and questions if Raven is seeking his death. The intensity of Ron's anger is palpable, even to the guards nearby. In response, Raven suggests that if Ron dislikes the situation so much, they should settle it immediately through a competition. Raven takes hold of Ron's sword and boldly declares that if he loses, he will offer his own life. This statement further fuels Ron's fury, causing him to shout, you bastard, and swing his sword at Raven. In the area where weapons are stored, the guards overhear the events unfolding inside. Suddenly, a voice from within apologizes to the Grand Master. Raven emerges from the room, appearing visibly saddened and bearing obvious signs of being beaten. He uses a cloth-covered object for support as he walks away. The guards speculate whether Sir Ron, the Grand Master, inflicted the injuries on the young child. 
One guard acknowledges the difficulty of being so talented at such a young age and mentions rumors circulating about Raven becoming the next leader. The other guard asks about the rumors, to which the other guard whispers that people are saying the Grandmaster dislikes Raven and that the child may be the future leader. The guard understands that there might be a reason behind the Grandmaster's actions but believes it is still excessive. They decide not to get involved and prioritize their own safety. Raven proceeds to enter the house, where concerned maids look at him. They inquire about his injuries, and Raven explains that the Grandmaster had something to give him but that something happened between them. The maids advise him to rest and offer their assistance if needed. Raven expresses gratitude and retreats to his room. Later, Baron is seated when a man approaches and presents him with a drink. Baron asks about the situation with the sacrifice, and the man assures him that it has been kept safe. Baron inquires whether there were bodies from the wolf gang, which leads him to realize that Raven, the child, has caused a significant problem. Nonetheless, Baron decides to let Raven get away with it, considering it a minor issue. He believes that confirming Raven's family background in a few days will benefit his own ambitions. However, Baron is concerned that if Raven does not belong to the claimed family, it could implicate both Baron and those responsible for the wolves. Nevertheless, Baron is confident in Raven's behavior, speech, and knowledge, believing that the child comes from a respected family. Baron contemplates the likelihood of a child defeating a knight solely based on their skill and speculates that Raven must have learned a special technique from his family. Baron also notes that Raven's black hair and eyes serve as strong evidence of his origins. As Baron lies in bed, he anticipates meeting Raven and suddenly senses a magical alert. Assuming it to be a bothersome slave, Baron is surprised to discover that Raven is the source. Raven stabs Baron in the chest with Ron's sword, declaring that Baron must pay for his sins. Baron dies on the bed. The next morning, Amei discovers Baron's lifeless body, and everyone gathers in Baron's room. Finn informs them that a priest has already examined the scene and found traces of dark energy, which they have reported to the church. Additionally, an investigator from the royal palace will soon arrive. A knight remarks on Baron's deteriorated appearance, resembling someone dead for weeks. They discuss how the bodies of black magicians decay quickly after death, shocked by Baron's condition. Gren wonders why Baron chose a path that would lead to his death and gave up his noble heritage. Gren realizes that there is no point in asking a dead person. They now face the issue of the sword, which they are certain belongs to their grandmaster. One knight raises the possibility that their grandmaster is responsible for Baron's death, suggesting a conflict over appointing Raven as the new grandmaster. However, another knight finds it hard to believe that Ron would act in such a way unless he had lost his mind. The absence of the Grandmaster further deepens the mystery. Gren urges them not to relax and initiates an investigation, starting with the maids. Gren deduces that all the maids claim to have witnessed Raven being struck by the Grandmaster. He believes having one witness will resolve everything and orders them to bring Raven to him. Raven, still bearing marks from the fight and appearing sorrowful, explains that the estate intended to provide him with armor, but he didn't receive it. Gren expresses frustration and asserts they had already checked the storage, finding traces but no sign of the Grandmaster. Nobody in the castle saw him, and he disappeared shortly after Raven's encounter with him. Gren asks Raven if he truly hasn't seen the Grandmaster since then, to which Raven confirms that he hasn't. Gren then questions Raven to ensure his certainty about the events. He asks if anything unusual occurred during that time. Raven proceeds to explain that Ron expressed intense disapproval of how the estate favored him, but Raven maintains that he hasn't encountered the Grand Master since that incident. Hearing this, Gren notices that Raven's account aligns perfectly with what the other servants have stated. Gren reassures Raven, expressing his understanding of the situation. Raven then inquires about his future and wonders what will happen next. He mentions that the estate head had promised him protection. After considering it for a moment, Gren advises Raven to return to the same location the next morning and tells him he can leave for now. As Raven exits the room, he ponders whether Gren is one of the knights working within the estate. He suspects that Gren may not be entirely virtuous but is perplexed by his inability to remember Gren's face. He questions himself, wondering if he simply forgot. As he reflects, Raven's memory resurfaces, reminding him of a vivid recollection of bravely standing up against and defeating his adversaries. Raven feels suspicious because Gren asked him to return even though he had already answered all the questions. For now, Raven decides to remain cautious. 
The next day, Gren gives Raven a medal indicating that he is a mercenary, along with some money. Gren explains that if Raven wants to go to a different place without any problems, he should have the identity of a mercenary or a merchant. This medal, made by Gren, will serve as proof of Raven's identity to others. Raven realizes that he was planning to obtain something like this anyway. Raven is curious why Gren is giving this to him, and Gren explains that staying in Blackwater will limit Raven's potential. Gren advises Raven to aim for bigger opportunities elsewhere. Gren adds that he is offering this advice as someone who has lived longer than Raven. Raven wonders if Gren might be saying this for himself as well. It makes sense that Raven can't remember Gren if Gren is planning to leave soon. Raven thanks Gren and admits he was also considering leaving. Raven believes that since a black magician has appeared, the royal family will soon intervene and stop the actions of that person. Raven has prevented the Duke's investigation team from coming as well. Raven decides to go there by himself. Gren reacts and expresses his gladness to hear that. He tells Raven that if he becomes successful, he should remember Gren's name. Raven then asks Gren for his name, which surprises Gren. Gren can't believe that Raven didn't know his name until now. Gren introduces himself as Gren Liberty and tells Raven to just call him Gren. Raven politely asks Sir Gren to also remember his name and leaves. Raven thinks that now, with both the estate head and the Grand Master gone, the future of Files might rely on Gren, the knight. Raven feels a bit sorry for Gren as he overheard Gren saying that they would likely need a skilled tracking magician to find the Grand Master, which seems unsolvable. Since Raven now has a mercenary medal, he plans to borrow a horse from a guild. Suddenly, Wolf Lunar appears and starts barking. Raven understands the wolf's language and asks if Lunar is suggesting that he should ride him. Raven quickly declines, explaining that their destination is too far, and he doesn't want to get motion sickness from riding a wolf. Raven remembers how monsters once made fun of him for trying to ride a dire wolf, warning him that he might end up vomiting all the food he ate after just a few minutes. Raven tells the wolf that only someone like an orc, whose sense of balance is different, could manage it. But the wolf argues, and after some discussion, Raven agrees and climbs onto the wolf's back. Raven notices that Lunar looks about the same size as himself. He understands that when spirits show themselves, their size is determined by the strength of their master. While riding Lunar, Raven remembers something Astina told him about how a stronger spirit tamer's traits can affect the spirit's appearance. As Raven sits on Lunar's back, he feels a change in the wolf. Lunar is becoming sturdier and more powerful. This change, Raven realizes, is a sign of being a skilled spirit tamer. Lunar starts running, making it a challenge for Raven to hold on. Despite this, Raven can clearly sense everything Lunar does, how he moves, what he sees, and even his sense of smell. Raven believes that they will reach Valentino much faster than he originally thought. He even considers that they might be able to travel to places farther away, like Karun, where the first disaster is predicted to happen. In Raven's previous life, disasters struck one after another across the whole land, weakening humanity's strength and anticipating the arrival of the Demon King's army. It all began with the disappearance of Karan's relic. In this life, Raven is determined to prevent the disaster from happening again. The seven sacred objects given to humanity, known as the relics, were meant to be a last resort, but they were all taken in his past life. Now, Raven is resolved to grow stronger as he faces these disasters so that humanity can stand strong against the Demon King's army. After visiting the Duke, Raven plans to head to Karun, where the first disaster is predicted to occur. Meanwhile, an investigation team from the Imperial family is sent to look into the matter in files. People read about the estate head's assassination in the newspapers, and there's a rumor that Baron might have been a black magician. People are cautious and choose to stay inside their houses just in case anything happens. A dark figure appears, emitting black smoke, and the guards outside Baron's house confront it. However, the figure easily incapacitates them with a simple gesture. Gren notices this and prepares his sword, demanding to know the figure's identity. The figure claims to have something to ask and wants Gren to provide information about the situation surrounding the estate head's assassination. Under some sort of magic, Gren starts revealing everything he knows. The figure then asks about the location of the estate head's body, which Gren explains was placed in his bedroom following the request of the Empire's investigators. The figure instructs Gren to wake up in an hour and disappears. After an hour, Gren wakes up and realizes he might have fallen asleep. 
A servant informs Gren that there's a problem, the estate head's body has disappeared. This is an important clue related to black magic. In the forest near Files castle, someone wielding Ron's sword realizes that its owner is already dead and suspects that the black-haired kid who disappeared after the incident is responsible. This person decides to make Raven suffer for interfering with their plans. Meanwhile, Raven finds himself amidst a large crowd of people outside the west gate of Lucentia Castle, with many heading towards Valencia. He realizes that if that person takes action, things might get complicated. Raven is eager to acquire his equipment and checks the money Gren gave him, feeling thankful for Gren's kindness but deeming it insufficient. Two men approach Raven, demanding money. However, Raven cleverly asks if they have any money on them as well. In his past life, there was an unspoken rule on the dark streets, people stayed silent when a big shadow appeared. Suddenly, a person approached him, warning that his soul would become tainted if he continued to kill so many people. When Raven turned around, the man told him that one day his conscience would torment him and question why he couldn't show mercy. Raven responded confidently, saying that he would be unaffected if that were to happen. The man pointed out that Raven was on the verge of murdering someone. In response, Raven clarified that he had never actually killed anyone, surprising the priest with this revelation. Raven explained that he was merely eliminating what he considered to be human trash. Returning to reality, Raven effortlessly defeated the two men who had planned to rob him. Onlookers were astonished as he effortlessly took down the notorious Rufus gang, known for their strength comparable to knights. Seeing the two men trembling, Raven sarcastically remarked that he didn't realize knights were so weak, given their reputation for strength. This further angered the two men, who charged at him with swords. Raven swiftly threw his wallet, striking one of the men in the face and sending him flying backward into his companion. The man at the back was shocked as he watched Raven approach, delivering a powerful kick to his face and sending him crashing into the other gang members. With all the men lying on the ground, Raven retrieved their wallets, remarking with a smirk that at least they had a hefty sum of money. The man warned Raven that their boss wouldn't let him get away with this. Ignoring the threat, Raven chuckled at the sight of the money, confident that he had acquired a substantial haul. Raven then proceeds to buy armor made from the leather of an iron bull from Mount Nambu. Outside the shop, two men discuss their inability to get close to someone beautiful, and Raven wonders if there is a special event happening. The seller informs him that the princess of Valencia is going to patrol the streets. Raven remembers the lessons he learned about affection and hope from Irena and the princess, respectively, which helped him in his escape from invaders. Raven wonders if both of them will later play a significant role in changing his life. If the princess recognizes and approves of Raven's existence, it will serve as evidence that he has lived according to her expectations. Raven recalls a previous encounter with the princess in his past life, where she referred to him as tiny. However, she later realized that he had grown bigger and declared that he was no longer small enough to be called by that name. Now, Raven speculates that she may have forgotten about him since they are meeting again so soon. Nevertheless, he believes that she will remember him in this life. As a result, Raven decides that he will ask her for a favor, specifically to help him meet the Sword Emperor. Edmund guides the princess around the city, highlighting its notable features, such as the largest market. However, the princess expresses disinterest in trade and business and instead expresses a desire to visit the slums. This surprises Edmund, and he questions her motives for wanting to go there. The princess explains that she wants to observe the living conditions of the people who are part of her land. Edmund agrees to accompany her to the slums. The princess ponders why Edmund is taken aback by her request, considering that he should have been trained to understand such matters. She recalls her father's teachings about caring for those who are struggling the most to improve their lives and benefit the country. The princess wonders if her father's behavior is unusual, as he practices what he learns. However, she realizes that her life will soon be constrained when her fiancé is chosen and announced, limiting her freedom. She contemplates seeking solace in a temple and serving there, as the call to love and serve at the temple has been present for a long time. However, she understands that her father would be saddened by her growing old and lonely if she were to choose that path. Suddenly, Raven approaches her, and she wonders why a child is present. Edmund asks his guards about the child's identity and origin. The princess instructs Raven to leave immediately. However, Raven presents a ring that the princess had given him, claiming that she had instructed him to find her. 
He explains that it took some time, but he is now here, just as she desired. Upon seeing the ring, the princess confirms that it is indeed hers but expresses confusion as she had given it to a child from the slums. The guards surround Raven, their weapons at the ready, and demand an explanation. Aware that it may be too soon to meet the princess, Raven acknowledges the difficulty of believing his story but insists that he is the same child from before. He points out that he is the only one in the land of files with black hair and possibly the only one in the entire region. The princess remains perplexed, stating that he appeared much poorer and weaker before and couldn't speak as he does now. Raven recollects that it was due to the influence of the wolf. The princess clarifies that the child in the slums was much smaller and pitiable but cute. At this point, Raven formulates an idea and presents Lunar, the wolf, to the princess. She affectionately embraces Lunar, remarking on its incredible cuteness. The guards inform her that Lunar is cute but is, in fact, the spirit of a stranger. The princess continues to cuddle Lunar, mentioning that she heard that spirits only bond with those with pure hearts. Raven smirks, acknowledging the truth of this statement. A guard notices that Raven possesses real weapons and a spirit. The princess inquires about the spirit's name, and Raven reveals that he named it Lunar Wolf, signifying a wolf that appears in the moonlight. The guard acknowledges that Raven also knows languages from the east. The princess finds the name appealing and comments that she didn't expect Raven to change so much in just a few months. She recalls that Raven seemed much younger than 10 years old back then and notes that his name also meant small or something similar. Raven corrects her, stating that his name is Raven, and he recently turned 13. He explains that after learning mana, he started growing faster. The princess realizes that his name indeed referred to his small stature. Guard Vivian then asks Raven about his true identity, speculating if he is some kind of demi-human. Vivian apologizes for her brusque questioning in front of the princess but asserts that her duty is to ensure the princess's safety. Edmund finds Raven suspicious and suggests keeping him away from the princess. Raven asserts that he will not force others to believe him and mentions that the princess instructed him to seek help whenever he needed it. This statement angers Edmund, and he is astonished by how the child disregards him. The princess acknowledges that she did, indeed, make the statement and asks Raven if he requires her assistance. Raven, in turn, asks if he can meet Mr. Odin von Valentia the Sword Emperor. This revelation shocks Vivian, prompting her to call Raven crazy for making such a request. Raven questions the princess, asking if she truly believes he could harm Mr. Odin von Valentia the Sword Emperor. Considering that Mr. Odin von Valentia of the seven superhumans of the continent, known as the Sword Emperor, possessing aura and the power of destruction. The princess laughs at the nickname, Sword Emperor, and mentions that even her father would feel embarrassed to hear it. She explains that her father was recognized as one of the seven greatest knights on the continent, but she wasn't aware he was this famous even in the countryside. This realization brings relief to Raven, as the princess's reaction is positive. He clarifies that he wants to inform Mr. Odin von Valentia art about the recent incident in Files, as someone who experienced it firsthand. Later, inside the princess's room, Vivian informs her about everything Raven shared, and the princess asks if there's anything else he told her that she's keeping from her. Vivian explains that there isn't anything more, as Raven only mentioned the estate head in Files being a black magician and the possibility of someone being behind him. The princess realizes that Raven, as an important witness who experienced this event, wants to meet her father anyway. She decides to go see her father immediately. Vivian asks how long she plans to keep the spirit in her lap and if it's harmful to her in any way. The princess lifts up Lunar and asks if Vivian is referring to the small and cute child. Vivian refrains from looking at it too much, contemplating the word, cute. The princess then asks Vivian about Raven's whereabouts, but Vivian is unsure and explains that Sir Edmund said he had some business with Raven and took him away. This news startles Lunar, and he runs off. Edmund takes Raven to a secluded location to have a proper conversation. Edmund asks for Raven's name, and Raven tells him. Edmund questions if Raven just spoke to him as if they were friends, but Raven doesn't answer and instead asks if Edmund really knows something about the black magician. Edmund responds, admitting that he made it up earlier because Raven was being difficult and that he doesn't actually care about the black magician. Raven asks Edmund if he lied to him, and Edmund tells him to stop talking back. In response, Raven calls Edmund illiterate, which angers him. Edmund attempts to slap Raven while asking if he has any manners, 
but Raven stops the slap by grabbing Edmund's hand. This infuriates Edmund, who demands to know how Raven dares to block him. Raven twists Edmund's hand, causing him to scream in pain. Edmund warns Raven that if he continues to act impolitely, he will report it to the princess. Edmund then questions Raven, asking how dare he use violence against a noble person. Raven finds amusement in the word, noble, and asks what it means. He challenges Edmund, telling him to do whatever he wants but also expressing his desire to see what Edmund is capable of. Raven believes Edmund called him for a reason. Edmund agrees and tells Raven to come with him. Meanwhile, Vivian is riding on her horse and remembers that the princess instructed her to find Raven quickly. Initially assuming the princess was overreacting, Vivian realizes that Edmund has indeed taken the kid to the castle. She hopes she isn't too late to intervene. A man comes out of the palace and speaks to Edmund, questioning why the young leader has come to that place. Rufus, the leader of the Rufus gang, and his group are also present. Rufus asks Edmund why he's there, mentioning that the deadline is still far away and wondering if Edmund is searching for the product. Raven realizes that his suspicions were correct, and Edmund confirms that he didn't come to discuss the product. He orders Rufus to teach Raven, the cheeky commoner, a lesson. Rufus is surprised that Edmund refers to a kid and asks if he means Raven. Edmund slaps Rufus and warns him to know his place, instructing Rufus not to argue and to educate Raven instead. Rufus agrees and commands Eric and Tillman to teach Raven a lesson. Eric and Tillman begin approaching Raven, but upon reaching him, they are surprised when Raven greets them and expresses pleasure in meeting them again. This reaction angers and frightens Eric and Tillman. Rufus asks them why they're standing still and trembling, and Eric explains that Raven is the kid they previously talked about, requesting Rufus to punish him. Rufus tells Raven that he's in trouble and states that his overconfident attitude won't work there. He attempts to attack Raven with his weapon, but Raven quickly draws his own weapon and strikes Rufus hard, sending him flying to the ground. Rufus falls immediately, incapacitated by Raven's powerful attack. Eric and Tillman are shocked by Raven's strength and hesitate to make a move. Raven hurled his weapon at his opponents, taunting them by asking if that was all they had. Edmund, filled with fear, cowered and crawled to the ground, pleading with Rufus to protect him. However, Raven challenged him, sarcastically asking if Rufus could actually protect him and daring them to try. As they gazed into Raven's face, a look of terror overcame them, as if they were about to be devoured. Overwhelmed by fear, they collapsed to the ground, prompting Raven to deem them useless. He hadn't expected the gang leader to be such a pathetic loser. Raven then questioned what their next move would be. Two men standing behind Raven trembled in fear, visibly shaken. Raven questioned them if they still wanted to fight, but their fear turned them into statues, frozen and unable to respond. Suddenly, Vivian arrived on the scene, visibly surprised by the sight before her. All the men were knocked down, and two of them were carrying a vault filled with money. Meanwhile, Raven sat above the vault, engrossed in reading a book. When he noticed Vivian, he descended from the vault and asked her why she had come all the way there. Vivian explains that she was sent by the princess to check on Raven due to concerns. Raven hands over the book to Vivian and explains that it contains evidence of bribery, indicating the involvement of Eric and Tillman in a horrific act of human trafficking. Raven acknowledges that even he couldn't ignore such compelling evidence. Vivian questions Raven about his experiences until now. The following day, Edmund is disowned by his noble family due to the previous night's events. Raven, the princess, and Vivian are together in a carriage, traveling somewhere. The princess mentions that Edmund might have been associated with the human trafficking group for a long time and that this incident has tarnished the noble family's reputation. Vivian realizes that the relationship between the princess and the noble family will likely worsen in the future and apologizes to the princess. The princess asks Vivian if she truly believes she made a mistake, and Raven honestly doesn't think so. The princess, holding Lunar, expresses her certainty and states that rewards and punishments should be fair, regardless of social status, which aligns with her father's beliefs. Vivian questions why the princess is looking at her in a certain way, and the princess reveals that when Edmund fainted, Vivian should have at least injured one of his limbs because he escaped without any consequences. Vivian responds, finding it harsh. Raven realizes that this is where their journey begins, referring to the youngest daughter of the famous sword emperor and the talented female knight. Sometimes they resemble sisters, other times a mother and daughter, 
but their relationship has a unique dynamic that remains intact even as situations change. Raven speculates that she probably enjoys acting as a protective older sister or mother figure to Princess asks Raven what he's thinking, and he reflects on how Edmund seemed to value his noble status above everything else. He acknowledges that nothing can make up for Edmund's wrongdoing, but being expelled from his family. Vivian questions how Raven can speak that way, wondering if he's truly just a kid. The princess discusses the matter with Lunar, affirming that Raven makes a valid point. Raven is confused and asks about the moon. The princess explains that she found it difficult to pronounce Lunar's name, so she decided to call him Moon. She asks Lunar if he likes the name, and Lunar responds with a bark. Raven asks the princess if she blames him or is wary of him. The princess responds that she heard a story about a dark-haired kid who dismantled an underworld organization and rescued victims, similar to the current incident, which she finds remarkable. Raven is pleased that the princess believes in him. The princess advises Raven to inform her first if a similar situation arises in the future, and Raven assures her that he understands. Three days later, their carriage unexpectedly stops, and they wonder why. The carriage driver explains that an elf has requested a ride. They look outside and see Irena, an attendant of the World Tree, introducing herself and asking to travel with them for a while. Raven realizes that Irena is a powerful black magician of the Fifth Circle, which surprises him as it's uncommon to see elves in the middle of the Aslan Empire. Elves are typically associated with fairies, known for their beauty, and their kingdom, Elfenheim, is located in the far west of the continent. Elves possess the unique ability to communicate with spirits and are renowned for their purity, virtue, and peaceful nature. The princess inquires about Irena's journey and whether she is heading north to the kingdom of war beasts. Irena asks if it's acceptable for her to join the group from the Aslan Empire, acknowledging the historical conflict between the Empire and the Kingdom of War Beasts. The princess considers it not a significant issue but notes that Irena is embarking on a long journey to explore the world and collect stories. The princess acknowledges that she is aware of Irena's goal and asks if Irena is referring to the elite group of elves known as the Eleven Knights. Irena confirms this and praises the princess for her knowledge. Irena then asks if the princess is the one who owns the spirit she is holding. The princess confirms that Raven is the spirit's owner. Irena expresses surprise, as she had heard that there aren't many human spirit tamers. Raven realizes that Irena holds significant importance and hadn't anticipated her being so important. Raven tells Irena that he hasn't seen an elf before and understands that he can't challenge her in his current state, as he isn't strong enough to face her. Fortunately, Irena remains unaware of Lunar Wolf's full capabilities, as only a spirit's contractor can truly grasp their detailed powers. Raven is curious about how Irena managed to hide such strong dark energy, Irena asks if she should demonstrate some magic to Raven and ignites her hand using magic. Raven notices that she seems to be drawing mana from the surroundings. He remembers Argon's words from his past life about differentiating between mana and dark energy and regrets not heeding Argon's advice. Raven considered the potential battle scenario, taking into account the composition of their side. They had 12 third level knights who utilized mana, as well as Vivian, a fourth level mana swordsman. In terms of combat strength, the magician circles and the level of mana users could be considered equivalent. Raven concluded that if they wanted to defeat someone who was one level higher, they would need five individuals who were one level lower. In other words, for Raven, a second circle magician, to triumph over Arena, a fifth circle magician who was three levels higher, he would require more than 100 clones of himself. As Arena demonstrated her fire magic, Raven realized that it would be a suicidal endeavor to confront her directly, unless it was through a surprise attack. He clenched his fist, recognizing the need to seize the opportunity, as they had a trump card in their possession. Lunar, who had leapt from the princess's hands, landed on Vivian. The princess speculated that she had tickled Lunar too much, causing it to leave her. Vivian asked if she could hold Lunar for a moment. Irena mentions that Lunar is very cute and she wants to hug him. Raven asks if she'd like to hold Lunar, to which Irena agrees. Suddenly, Lunar grows into his large monstrous form and barks at Irena. In response, Vivian swiftly stabs Irena, and the guards notice dark energy emanating from Irena, indicating that she's a black magician. The princess is relieved that she got to see Raven's abilities when they learned that Irena was a high-ranking black magician. Raven suggests teaming up with Vivian, but the princess explains that this could become a big international issue, and she hopes Raven understands her perspective. 
Raven reminds her about the backup they have from Files' estate and the need to act quickly and surprise their enemy. Raven states that he's ready to take the responsibility even if it costs his life. When Lunar hopped into Vivian's hands, he communicated everything to her. Although Vivian managed to stab Irena, she missed her heart, and Irena puts up a protective shield around herself. Vivian commands the guards to prepare for battle and protect the princess. Raven leads the attack on Irena, but she uses a spell to block his attack. Irena is curious how they found out, and Raven explains that he could sense a bad smell. Irena questions if he played a trick on her and starts using powerful magic to make her shield stronger. Then, Raven activates his iron body, which weakens Irena's shield. Due to the strong push, Raven falls back but realizes it was a close call and that he's using his iron body for the first time in this life. Vivian orders the guards to attack Irena since her shield is weaker now, calling her a demon worshipper. Irena curses Vivian, and Raven suggests they join the fight as well. Everyone tries to attack Irena, but they miss because of a protective bubble shield around her. Irena mentions that she initially planned to kill just one person, but now she might as well kill them all. Vivian wonders if she should laugh at Irena's joke, but Raven tells Irena to stop with the nonsense. Both of them try to defeat Irena once again, and Irena gets very angry. Before she can react, Raven launches an attack from above that breaks her shield with a big explosion. Vivian tells her guards to start attacking Irena, and Raven notices that despite the explosion, Irena still seems okay. Irena uses her black magic again to make her shield even stronger, and the shield grows towards the princess. Vivian quickly positions herself between the princess and the shield, protecting her. Vivian tells her guards to wait for a moment as the shield turns into a kind of black magic flame. Raven floats through the flame, thinking it's nice because now he can block the flame completely. This improvement makes Raven's iron body skill stronger than it was in his previous life. Raven realizes that they just need to keep attacking as much as they can. His plan is working well as the flame suddenly explodes, and they all fall onto their backs. Irena is sitting there holding her stab wound and without any shield. Riding on his wolf, Raven pursues Irina, confident that his plan is working and that he just needs to launch one final attack. Vivian rushes towards Irena to join the attack, but Irina employs her black magic once again to prevent them from getting closer. Vivian is surprised by Irina's enduring strength. Undeterred, Raven breaks through the blockade and continues his advance towards Irina, using his weapon to deliver a powerful strike. The impact creates a loud explosion. Irina attempts to flee but Vivian orders her guards to pursue her. Irina calls out to a demon for help, prompting Raven to wonder if she is resorting to the final trick of demon worshippers known as self-immolation, where they sacrifice their bodies to enhance their magic. Irina uses her powers to set everyone ablaze, and they scramble to save themselves. Observing that the guard knights are already exhausted, Raven realizes that a strong attack is needed to swiftly defeat Irina. He informs the princess that they have given Irena enough time, and it's now their turn to strike. The princess closes her eyes and begins a mysterious action, summoning a powerful light spell. She explains that people can gain strength through blessings and hard work called divine power, which grants them a special ability to combat evil. She reveals that some individuals are born naturally strong, known as knights, who undergo rigorous tests. She further mentions that certain holy individuals who remain with their families are called clerics. The guards protecting the princess are amazed as they witness her employing light magic, as they were unaware of her abilities. Even the renowned sword emperor appeared apprehensive about her abilities. Raven acknowledges that he has never seen a cleric stronger than Chloe and realizes that Chloe's strength is more than sufficient. Chloe strikes Irena with her summoned light, causing Irena to fall in shock at her defeat. Raven delivers a powerful blow to Irena's head with his weapon, declaring that it's time to end this since everyone else is incapacitated. The princess approaches Raven, urging him not to kill Irena, as they still need to question her. The princess stands beside the fallen Irena, expressing her confusion at not sensing any malevolent energy from her, despite being a cleric. She intends to understand the reason behind these events. Raven encourages her to continue, and the princess contemplates using her special energy to heal Irena. Raven informs her that it is her choice, even if it means ending her life. The princess realizes they may have no other option. Suddenly, Irina's body disintegrates into ashes and black smoke, similar to what happens to dark wizards when they die. The knights approach the princess, expressing amazement that she is indeed a cleric and praising her abilities. 
The princess admits that her secret is out and feels like she is the one who lost. She then asks Raven if he already knew about her abilities. Raven affirms that he was the only one not surprised by her strong powers. The princess inquires how he discovered her secret, which even her family was unaware of. Raven explains that he cannot provide an explanation at the moment but promises to reveal everything someday. The princess agrees and accepts Raven's response. Surprised by the ease of their conversation, Raven ponders the fact that the black wizard targeted him due to his actions prior to their meeting. The princess's reaction surprises him, as she does not perceive the situation as dangerous because of his involvement. She believes it is the duty of someone noble to defeat demon worshippers and takes responsibility for her own lack of strength, stating that if she had died, it would have been her own fault. The princess pats Raven's head, finding his worry about her endearing. Vivian interrupts, playfully squeezing Raven's cheeks and remarking that kids his age usually dislike being called cute. The princess interrupts their banter, emphasizing that discussing such matters is not important at the moment. She needs to inform her father about the events involving Irena as soon as possible and make a report in the nearest city. They now stand at the Thiven front gate, and Raven realizes that while he knew the Sword Emperor loved his daughter dearly, this turn of events is unexpected. The princess becomes embarrassed and questions why her father had to do something like this. The guard knights, along with Raven, gaze ahead in awe, recognizing the approaching Blue Wing Knight troop is highly skilled and the best in the country. The leader of the Blue Wing Knight troop, known for their speed, removes his helmet and kneels before the princess. He introduces himself as Garen Clemen, the vice leader of the Blue Wing Knight troop, accompanied by 104 other knights. Garen expresses gratitude for the princess's well-being and assures her that they will follow her orders. The princess thanks Garen and instructs all the knights to stand. Garen complies and mentions that her father has been deeply concerned about her, which is why they were sent to greet her. The princess questions the necessity of the Blue Wing Knight troop's presence, stating that she had already assured her father of her safety. Garen explains that they were sent because she was attacked by a black wizard. He adds that if it weren't for an urgent situation at home, her father would have come himself. Curious about the emergency, the princess inquires further. Garen reveals that the family treasure, Tempest, went missing about a month ago. This news surprises the princess, and she confirms that it is the artifact her father usually carried with him. Garen explains that the treasure disappeared when her father woke up one day. The princess becomes fixated on the word, Tempest, and asks about the vanished family treasure, wondering if it holds significant power. She shares her suspicion that it might be an incredible artifact, although only the head of the family knows the secret. Raven, overhearing the conversation, suggests that he knows why the treasure disappeared and requests a meeting with the princess's father to reveal everything. The group embarks on their journey, with Garen leading the way, pondering how a young child like Raven could possess such knowledge. Garen asks one of the guard knights about the child, referring to Raven. The knight confirms that Raven is indeed exceptional and played a significant role in defeating the black magic. Garen is amazed that someone so young possesses such remarkable skills, surpassing even the expertise of the seven greatest knights. He wonders if Raven is a genius but corrects himself, calling him a monster. Garen's excitement about supporting and nurturing the talented Raven is interrupted by the realization that Raven is the same person who sent a letter from Files. Recognizing the rarity of the name Raven, Garen is certain that the child inside the carriage is the one they are referring to, alongside the princess and Vivian. As they travel, the princess notices beautiful lilac fields outside the window and leans forward to get a better look. Raven asks if she likes lilac flowers, and the princess expresses her fondness for them, mentioning that her father and late mother loved them too. Vivian adds that the love between the duke and his wife is widely known, as the duke only loved that one woman. Raven questions if the princess has never heard about it, to which she replies that she's uncertain calls a conversation from her previous life with Sword Emperor Odin, who mentioned not liking the flower. She understands why the Duke kept it a secret. Realizing the urgency to meet the Duke and seek his help in becoming stronger, Raven is determined to become an or a master and defeat powerful demons. Upon arriving in Valentino, the city where the main castle of Valencia Duke is located, the night guards celebrate their return home. Chloe inquired if Raven had ever been to Valentino, to which he responded that it was his first time experiencing it in this existence. Chloe became perplexed by his use of the phrase, in this life. Their attention was then drawn to the sudden approach of an individual. 
it was none other than the Sword Emperor, who expressed concern for his child, Chloe. Raven was taken aback by the unexpected presence of the Sword Emperor in this particular lifetime. The Duke approaches Chloe, filled with tears of joy and wanting to embrace her, but she evades his hug, mindful of the public setting. The princess reminds her father of the need to maintain his dignity and requests an apology to the knights who might have been bothered by the scene. The duke clears his throat and expresses his gratitude to everyone for their invaluable assistance in ensuring Chloe's safe return. He acknowledges that he wants to show his appreciation not just as the leader of Valentina but also as a father. He announces that he has arranged a party for everyone to enjoy, and there is unanimous agreement. Turning his attention to the princess, the duke inquires about the young boy named Raven. To his surprise, he realizes that he doesn't know who Raven is. The princess explains that she had previously informed the duke about Raven, emphasizing that Raven is the key witness in the incident involving the black magician. Apologizing for his forgetfulness, the duke explains that recent stressful matters have occupied his mind. Raven takes the opportunity to inform the duke that he wishes to discuss something concerning the missing Tempest. This revelation causes concern among the gathered individuals. Raven's boldness surprises the duke, who activates his soul pressure. Reacting quickly, Raven jumps back to protect himself and smirks, recognizing that even the Sword Emperor has much to learn. Raven marvels at the fact that the duke, as the Sword Emperor, possesses skills only comparable to an aura user. He draws a comparison to Astina, one of the seven greatest knights, who has already surpassed aura and become an aura exceeder. Additionally, Raven believes that Jirik is also nearing the level of an aura exceeder. Raven easily withstands the intimidation from the duke's soul pressure, thanks to the soul strength acquired from his previous life. He asks the duke if it would be appropriate to discuss matters here. The princess explains to her father that Raven is still young and sometimes acts without thinking. However, the duke disagrees, stating that an ignorant person wouldn't exhibit such behavior. He decides to have a conversation with Raven in his office. In his office, the duke asks Raven if he possesses any information regarding the disappearance of Tempest. Confirming his knowledge, Raven suggests that his speculations might be accurate. The duke encourages Raven to share what he knows. Raven begins by mentioning that the word, Tempest, signifies time or opportunity from ancient times, as the treasure vanished a month ago. He wonders if it possessed the power to turn back time. The duke asks Raven to elaborate on his statement. Raven proceeds to recount a future disaster that will occur 20 years later, revealing the entire story. The duke finds the story too convincing to be fabricated by a child. He points out that Raven even knows the names of the first hammer of the dwarves, the guardian of the world tree, and the great warrior of the orc tribe. Raven explains that these individuals were his friends who aided him. The duke chuckles and questions if Raven is referring to the formidable enemies the duke has been facing for some time. The duke elucidates that the word, Tempest, represents an opportunity or chance obtained by sacrificing the life of a powerful individual. Only one person can be sent back to the past, and descendants must exercise great caution when utilizing this power. These words have been passed down along with the family treasure. However, the duke admits that he never truly believed in them. After hearing Raven's story, though, he starts considering the possibility of their veracity. Nonetheless, he expresses skepticism about his own decision-making, pondering why Raven was sent back instead of himself, especially if he possessed the ability to use his knowledge and power from his past life to prepare humanity for the battle against the Demon King's army. Raven explains that only the future Duke would have been aware of these matters, inquiring if the Duke made promises to save his talents and other things, dismissing them as nonsense. Raven had suspected that the Duke might have become somewhat eccentric with age, the duke clarifies that it was because he didn't know how far back in time one could go. Raven questions if the duke used the power on him because of this uncertainty. Leaning back, the duke acknowledges that he couldn't be certain since he had never used the power before. He mentions the saying that one goes back to a time when their soul is deeply wounded. It seems that Raven returned to the past when he began comprehending things. The future duke must have anticipated that Raven would come back to this specific time. Realizing this, Raven understands why he was sent back to the day his sister died. Observing Raven's expression, the Duke asks if he said something that upset him. Raven clenches his fists but reassures the Duke that he didn't upset him. Relaxing his hands, Raven explains that it's not the Duke's fault. 
he decides to be grateful for the opportunity to see his sister one last time. The Duke reveals that there is one more thing he wants to confirm. Raven eagerly asks what it is. The Duke explains that he wants to know if the future Duke instructed Raven to come and meet him, surmising that he must have said something to Raven that proves Raven was sent by the Duke. Raven asserts that Duke's unborn child in the family has been named Lily, a flower admired by both the Duke and his wife. The Duke insists this is common knowledge, but Raven contradicts, stating the Duke dislikes that flower. The Duke, realizing the truth, laughs and agrees with Raven. He admits only someone like Raven would point that out, a fact he never admitted, even when his wife left. This is now a secret the Duke can't share. Uncertain if he should feel triumphant or amused, the Duke questions if Raven believes him. He thinks the family treasure's disappearance from his room is the only explanation and calls Knight Royer for verification. Raven asks about the Duke's intentions, and the Duke, unsure if Raven time traveled, wants him to prove it. He asks Raven to demonstrate the talent recognized by the future Duke. Leaving the room, the Duke is followed by Raven, realizing the Duke is testing him. Raven contemplates pranks but asks if there's something specific the Duke wants to know about the future. The Duke confirms but doesn't want personal information. He wants details about the one causing disaster. He advises Raven not to disclose more, as people learn from mistakes. The Duke requests not to take away his children's learning opportunity. Raven only knows about the Duke's daughter and admits his focus was on survival. The Duke, shocked, questions how Raven is unaware of the disaster. Raven claims common knowledge but the Duke demands more. Later, Raven provides a short account of the disaster, which the Duke finds lacking. Furious, he asks for more relevant information. Raven thinks the Duke should wait until he grows taller as they were powerful in their past life. The Duke reads that a hero and a saintess will appear. The saintess is Cromwell, 20 years old. The Duke decides to find and train her. Raven notes the hero is currently zero years old. The Duke questions God's test and contemplates blaming his future self for Raven. Interrupts to inform the Duke that Knight Royer has been summoned. The Duke asks for Drexler and plans to scold someone. Vice Captain Drexler arrives, and the Duke wants to test Raven's skills. Drexler greeted the Duke with great enthusiasm, and the Duke commended him for coming. The Duke then pointed at Raven and expressed his desire to test whether Raven was qualified enough to be arrogant. This confused Drexler, who asked if the Duke was suggesting a duel with a child. The Duke confirmed his request. Drexler wondered why he, as a vice captain, had been summoned for such a trivial matter. He questioned whether he had done something wrong to be demoted in this way. The realization struck him that he might lose his position, and Vice Captain Bongrock could potentially take over. Suddenly, the Duke shouted Drexler's name, interrupting his thoughts. The King asked if Drexler had once again fallen into useless imagination. The Duke commanded Drexler to focus, emphasizing that this was an important matter. He instructed Drexler to observe Raven carefully, and Drexler affirmed his understanding. As Drexler looked at Raven, he was shocked. He noticed mana flowing into the child's body and realized that Raven was at the second level, just one level away from becoming an expert. Drexler was surprised because Raven appeared to be around 10 years old, yet his mana manipulation was of high rank. Drexler's thoughts were interrupted when Raven asked who had made his weapon and if he could know their identity. Raven examined his weapon intently and expressed his desire for it to be slightly bigger, with a larger peen on the head and a one-inch longer handle. The Duke called out to Raven, reminding him to focus, as he needed to approach this duel seriously in order for the Duke to keep his promise to train him. The King informed Drexler that he could fight Raven fiercely, but he must keep the child alive. Raven was bewildered, asking the Duke what he meant by not keeping his promise. The Duke replied that the one who promised to help Raven was not the current Duke, but a future version of himself. The Duke would base his decision on Raven and Drexler's duel. Raven was perplexed, wondering if he was actually supposed to defeat Drexler. The Duke clarified that he did not expect that outcome. The Duke raised his finger, explaining that if Raven managed to inflict even a single wound on Drexler, he would consider it as Raven's victory. Determined and confident, Raven assured the Duke that he would remember his words. Raven and Drexler faced each other in the center of the Colosseum. The Duke noticed that Raven possessed a different technique for controlling his mana. He was certain that Raven had devised that technique himself and considered him a genius. The Duke watched attentively, considering that if Raven truly had future experience, 
the future version of the Duke might become an Aura Master after surpassing his limits. He wondered why, in that future, he had decided to send Raven to the past instead of going himself. There must be something more than talent in Raven. The Duke contemplated what the future version of himself had seen in this child. Finally, the Duke announced that they should fight with all their might. Raven summoned Lunar Wolf and mounted the creature, declaring that if Drexler wouldn't come to him, he would go to Drexler. Together, Raven and Lunar Wolf charged at Drexler. Drexler smiled, acknowledging that Raven was a spirit tamer, but he believed it to be useless. Drexler swung his hammer, but Raven and Lunar Wolf jumped to avoid the attack. Drexler was surprised that they managed to dodge. Raven infused his weapon with mana and struck Drexler's shoulder, swiftly moving behind him. However, the attack didn't penetrate Drexler's armor. Raven realized that Drexler specialized not only in offense but also in defense. As the fight continued, Drexler found it to be an interesting battle. He leapt, attempting an overhead, strike with his hammer, but he only hit the ground as Lunar Wolf jumped onto one of the pillars. Lunar Wolf started leaping from pillar to pillar, moving so quickly that Drexler could only see flashes of lightning. In response, Drexler infused his weapon with mana and smashed the ground, destroying the pillar. However, Raven and Lunar Wolf evaded the danger by jumping away. Suddenly, Raven sensed imminent danger. Drexler swung his hammer, but Raven narrowly avoided the attack, which displayed immense power, evident by the wind created by the swing. As Raven and Lunar Wolf landed on the ground, Raven recognized that Drexler could swing his hammer with the finesse of a light sword. Raven noticed that Drexler typically used his hammer in conjunction with a shield, but he currently lacked one. In response, Raven focused on dodging and searching for an opportunity. Drexler asked how long Raven planned to keep running. As Drexler swung his hammer, Raven and Lunar Wolf once again leapt to avoid it. Drexler looked back and taunted Raven, comparing his evasive actions to that of a rat. The Duke observed that Raven seemed to anticipate all of Drexler's movements. With their agility, the duo evaded every one of Drexler's attempted strikes. Raven managed to block an attack from behind, prompting the Duke to recall what Raven had mentioned about being one of the ten great knights in the future. The Duke speculated that Raven's past life experiences hadn't gone to waste. While acknowledging Raven's greatness, the Duke believed it wasn't enough. In response, the Duke shouted at Drexler, expressing his frustration at how long he intended to humiliate him. Upon hearing the Duke's words, Drexler became enraged and charged towards Raven. A knight shouting a battle cry, Drexler leapt high, once again attempting an overhead strike. The Duke was shocked when he realized that Drexler was using the technique of a soul weapon. The Duke recognized the need to intervene, but Raven was smiling. He leapt toward Drexler, releasing his aura and challenging him in midair. As the Duke's eyes widened, a massive explosion erupted from their clash. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button for more content. Feel free to leave a comment down below sharing your thoughts or suggestions. If you want to stay updated on all our latest uploads, click the notification bell icon. And hey, why not check out some of our other videos popping up on the screen right now. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so by liking, sharing, and subscribing. It really means a lot, peace.